I'm going to make a claim here that Einstein was right. Now, a lot of people will say, that's a totally simple conjecture because Einstein's been right about a lot of things. He's been wrong about things. There are things that we know we do not yet have the full story. We have pieces of the puzzle. We're using our best approximations, the methods we have been using to help explain a lot. But I'm going to make a claim that Einstein's original formulation of general relativity was correct because he had an image of a steady state, a universe, if you would, a realm of persistence that would continue on, would be able to self-propagate. And then at one point he's like, oh, that was totally wrong. Why? Because we had observations at the time that seemed to contradict that. But now we have new observations with our new tools of measurement that seem to be perhaps, up, according to some, uprooting a paradigm. You have folks making claims like, the Big Bang never happened. I would say the more appropriate question is, according to our best observations, what is the Big Bang to our relative observer frame here? Because I'm going to make a claim that I, just, I colloquially call eternal... I can spell it right. Eternal sick like cosmology. Yes. Talking and writing are not always the easiest things to do at the same time. But what's the claim here? According to many of the principles of GR and many people, we could try to imagine our realm, so to speak, is the N hypersphere of maximal volume. Perhaps a Riemannian sphere, a pseudo-Riemannian manifold. Again, do we know exactly what's going on? No. But I believe with our levels of measurement, the computational power provided by computers, large language models, neural networks, and just the Internet in general, people being able to come together, collaborate, have conferences online, in real life, that we can actually start to figure out what's going on. So... According to one of the models that Thad had first put out there in 44, I had read through it and it took me a while, it took me several times of reading through it and learning more to kind of get a picture in my head. And this is conjecture on my part. This is conjecture on my part, but I think it might explain a lot. So one of the interesting things that came up with is according to the parameterization, to the best of our knowledge, and what we've seen is once you have the parameterization of the simplest universe, at some point it needs to collapse and project out into what we know as the N hypersphere of maximal volume, basically our four dimensional space time, if you would, because space and time seem to be just woven together in such an important way that there are some folks that say, and I'm, I'm biased of this, uh, tend to believe that space and time, they may be discretized. Like there may actually be an infinitesimal, which is actually interesting because calculus is actually known as infinitesimal calculus. So very often we might treat something as a zero, except in certain instances. So what we're going to say here is, based upon some of that's calculations in the book, that and hypersphere, it is actually finite not infinite. And that seems like a completely crazy concept. It's not like any previous ideas in history have ever been heralded as crazy. But I'm going to make the claim for this conjecture that this end hypersphere is approximately 10, I don't need an A, 10 to the 32 meters. That's really freaking huge. Now, if that were the case, because some more recent observations, it, it's kind of interesting because it kind of looks like our universe as we know it seems to have zero curvature, plus or minus a, a waving hand right there. We'll, we'll say that. It's, it, it looks flat. It looks flat. Now, their current observations, we can only see out about 93 billion light years. That's really big. But that's 
10 to the 26 meters. That's six orders of difference, about 168,000 times. So again, if this calculation is correct, that means to our observations as little folks out here in the Milky Way at some point, yeah, that would explain the observation there. But the claim is going to be if we can get to a large enough scale at some point, we observe positive curvature. So what am I saying? How, how could this explain other things? And again, conjecture, but the other claim is there is a point tying everything together. Some may say almost a knot in the space-time fabric right in the center here. And that's approximately 10 to the negative 8 meters. Really freaking small. Smaller than a grain of sand. But it is an infinitesimal. The claim is there is something that would be in the form of the complement of the hyper eight, hyperbolic figure eight knot is basically you have this knot here and it's small but there's an articulation and there is a vortex growth there in that it has the ability to suck things up so to speak and send them back out. So just to kind of model this in a way rather than going through just all the math and everything, just something to consider. So if this was true, if this was true, here's what my mind is conceptualizing it as. Okay, you could have a whole bunch of hot particulate, call it matter, baryonic matter, oscillation, and you're going to have a whole bunch of that energy spewing out. Now, if it's spewing out, especially if there's any type of articulation or rotation here, we had the concepts of the ether. People are talking about superfluidity and now, now the exact solution, I don't know. But we're basing this off of kind of the laws of nature as we know them now. So if you have all this particulate spewing out here, at some point, it starts to cool down. And as it cools down, it forms protons, electrons neutrons and then you start to have the binding together of some of the more simpler elements and as gravity takes hold it starts to build bring those simpler components back together and everything and you start to have gas starting to come together so then it starts to form stars and then those stars start to come together and you get galaxies and as you get these galaxies i'm just going to try to essentially spin it what i would assume was the right way so you start to have all these galaxies start to forming all over the place. And as these begin to populate, again, gravity will take over. And as these galaxies come together, they're going to start to form larger and larger groups, clusters, if you would. And as these clusters begin to form, they form into larger clusters, they form into super clusters and everything. And again, according to money, major imaging and everything, the theoretical assumption is you're going to have a super dense point in those places that we colloquially call, refer to as black holes. So black holes, that's an interesting discussion of itself. I've completely speculated a lot of my thoughts on that seems to have been changed. Do I know if they're correct? No. But again, it might explain a lot. That's for another time. Um, as we start to have these large galaxies come together, at some point, given enough time, gravity will still probably come, and they're going to get larger and larger. And we've already had the theoretical limit was like 50, 50 billion masses of the sun. Well, according to some observations now, people are conjecturing maybe it's 66 billion. Is there actually a limit? What I'm going to say is, I personally don't think there's a limit. That's just my personal opinion about that. But if you start having all this matter, all these coming together, maybe we can get some, perhaps what we may colloquially call a hypermassive black hole. Things larger than we could just imagine. There'd be monsters out there, I claim. So whether it's in this form or just a galaxy cluster, as you get all this immense amounts of mass, 
cycling through because we're going to assume some form of thermal dispersion to even things out the whole entropy thing that a lot of people can't even agree on what exactly entropy means we have dimensional uh boundaries and everything but the interesting thing we were actually talking about this a little bit last night echelon is entropy almost kind of seems weird for physics it's like well at one time, I, at point, I forget who it was, but somebody said, well, these equations look like entropy, just call it entropy, because nobody knows what entropy is. And it's like, that's weird. Again, some people seem to put some hand-waving, but again, there are actual rigorous calculations to this. And it's funny because you were like, last night within programming, well, if we're running scripts and stuff like that, well, that kind of seems to be things changing. Entropy is essentially the continued disorder of things. So what I'm going to claim is you have a whole bunch of matter. If you have some type of vortex articulation where it's sucking things in and spewing them out, what happens if you were to get a whole bunch of matter going in through an incredibly small yet finite volume? If at that point it's being compressed and going under some very complex articulation at the center of our realm of persistence itself, I, I, I mean, wouldn't that be the equivalent of just compressing something and then kaboom? Some may view that as a big bang. And then the cycle would continue. Because it's also interesting in that, I know Professor Wolfram, he had been uh, discussing a lot about uh, the work on the second law of thermodynamics. And within the realm of the laws of thermodynamics, it is actually conjectured that they say a perpetual motion machine, so to speak. It can't exist, well, except for the third type. What is the third type? The third type would have to be a system with a boundary. There's a boundary at some point, and it would need to have maximal efficiency. Some may say the most efficient form of being able to persist. And since the Gieskin manifold is the smallest non-orientable manifold. And our claim is we have a double cover of that. And there's a very complex articulation going on. If the cycle continued, if matter comes in, whether it's black hole, whatever it is, if there's a point dense enough, cinching the cosmos themselves together at a point that could bring them in, expel them out, I sit back and Professor Einstein, he believed in the cosmological constant. He believed in, now, we didn't know about all these different geometric states. We didn't have the computational power that we do have now. But there was something in his head, and he worked on it up until the day he died, looking for that right Calabian manifold, trying to get things to line up. I'm going to claim Einstein was right. Because the cosmological constant, it tends to be lambda. So we have lambda. And that's, it could be, what well, well, it could be plus, it could be minus. Well, I just look at this as, well, that's going to be what's going on with our bulk here. What if it was plus and minus? Almost a source and a sink. Kind of like electromagnetism. Just because if we're going to look at those equations, those equations are very beautiful and explains a lot. And we try to extrapolate using models that we know, the simplest models that we know, to try to explain our observations. So what does this have to do, the heck to do with JWST? Well, JWST is measuring some galaxies that, according to our model, we assume approximately 14 billion light years. It's okay. We believe that galaxies with a certain level of redshift so far away that if they appear as developed as our Milky Way, or perhaps even more massive, more developed than our Milky Way, that's not something we were expecting. How could we explain this? And we're trying to tweak our models. I'm saying, no, most of our models, they look to be pretty dang good. They seem to be right. What parameter might we be not accounting for? So if we're going to assume that if we're over here at about 14 billion light years okay so if we were to rewind that to the point where we were at a hot quark gluon plasma so to speak it's well 
Maybe there were other galaxies, maybe going the other way. Maybe the entire relative system conjecture might be a little greater than 14 billion years old. Because I look at this model, and if I, I were to assume as efficient as possible, if it was a potential petrol, perpetual motion machine, how could we get that? Well, it might not be within the realm of we humans to do so, but is it within the realm of nature itself? If it was possible, how would we go about that? And that's this claim right here. Just because if the time was greater, just if you just adjust that one parameter, at that point, it's like, well, there, wouldn't there be more black holes? Wouldn't there be more neutrinos as well? Like forms that we actually know, like the dark matter that we know of exists if we did have a model, and if it did happen to be greater the amount of time for the entire system than 14 billion years, it might explain a lot. So, just kind of want to put that out there. Do you want to go with that? Sure. All right. I couldn't help but keep focusing on one particular aspect of this structure. So. You're talking about how we've got a cosmological model now, which happens to be at its largest scales, much, much larger than the universe we're aware of so far, right? But it's finite. And it's we're claiming the simplest possible geometric self-balanced structure that you can have. Okay, and it's based on the minimum three manifold and then externally the N hypersphere of maximal volume. Well, that means that we end up with a two-dimensional surface on the very outside, maintained at first step on the inside with a four-dimensional surface, right? It goes from two-dimensional to four-dimensional. But what does that mean when things are going through the middle? When things are coming out from the inside in this cycle, if you think of it like a vortex, okay? That means that the things that come out have an upside and a downside and when they come back in here they're inside out right mm -hmm. okay and you you said here there's a cycle that they go through but it's the last part of the cycle is black holes right so if you think a black hole goes in or a boundary of a black hole but it comes out an inside out boundary of a black hole Okay, so a black hole has its boundary where it all focused towards some center. But the inside-out boundaries of a black hole, no one has an idea what that is. But we're claiming here in the model, it always inverts this way. This whole collection of possible boundaries here are exactly the inside-out boundaries. All the boundaries of matter are the inside-out boundaries of a black hole. <laughs> I don't know if that made sense. It's a little bit new way of structuring a sentence for that or new way of talking about it, but I hope it makes sense. So you can, the surface comes out and, and it has to be exactly inside out each time as it goes through the it, center. It, it, it's funny because one of my other friends, uh, colleague, she's been saying this for a while now and I really haven't understood what she meant by that. And now I'm like, all right, well, that's telling me basically the same thing. It's just our conceptualization. That's why I'm like, I think we're all kind of heading in the same direction. What did she say? She basically is saying uh, it's more of a one-sided surface, but basically you're still seeing that inversion. Because it's there. a Mobius. Right, She's right. Right, okay. So what you're kind of saying is that the entire universe is the opposite of a black hole. No, it's both a black hole and its opposite put into balance. It's part, you create a boundary called a black hole and exactly the opposite boundary, whatever the image is, right? But you put them actively engaged with each other, forming another boundary that's closed. You make that closure be the boundary of the minimum possible manifold. So now you've got a system who's using its own parts over and over and over. It's actively wanting to go there and other parts actively want to go there to fill in where you're going and everything's closing perfectly, right? So you can look at the boundaries from the outside of the positive curvature and think of them as say a black hole boundary, or you can be looking at the boundaries from the inside of the curvature and be now looking at the boundaries of matter. So all, all zeros are double-sided. 
Okay, the zero is a division boundary, uh, the limit of division, right? It's, it's how you break up the things that are dividing things. The zero determines that in the system. So zeros in a balanced construction or in a mathematically balanced arena, okay, the zero always defines a boundary and it's always double-sided. So you can think of the universe you're aware of as half of the story and inside of that or Outside of that, it would depend on which one you want to see yourself. Are you on the inside or the outside? <laughs> but on the other side is the story of the black hole surfaces. The zero boundaries still. Okay, So all zero boundaries are double-sided. Division boundaries being held up by something. All hurricanes have wind speeds on one side, even with wind speeds on another side. They're double-sided. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's why I went on to, my mind went off on that when you were talking about this. But this is a cosmological model that's extremely satisfying because you can specify and stipulate every single geometric structure through the scales that exists. It's finite, first of all, right? And it forms all the way to a balanced projection of one sphere. Very easy so far to understand. But notice, if you're, if you're in a universe before you have anything like this, and it's just random noise... So somehow there's an infinite randomness <laughs> around, then um, to form this, or in that, in that region of randomness, there's no coherent meaning to scale of any kind. Time, space, charge, mass, temperature, they don't mean anything. A scale, the second, doesn't mean anything. The meter doesn't mean anything if you're in a universe that's completely infinite random noise. There's no meaningful structure built in. Scales don't exist until a minimal universe exists and its pieces that make it up, the different size pieces that make that minimal universe up, at the same time working together to find different scales by which you can now make meaningful measure. And all those scales are born together. <laughs> you go from no meaningful me me measurements, no scales in existence, to a minimal constructible universe that comes with minimal scales, dimensions, and size. Not that there's a certain number of different kinds of dimensions, not just a number of kinds, but you have different sizes assigned a scale associated each one. That's important, right? If you have a minimal construction, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be an actual size for each of the different kinds, not a fuzzy conceptual size. It's an actual size. So scaling is important, but it's important in two reasons. Not just because it gives you scales to make measures, but conceptually it gives you bases of measure. Things that can be measured. <laughs> That's the point. So the things that can be measured are reported via numbers too, as long as you're reporting in those bases. Those numbers are actually cons are, um, inscriptions of a balance in the system, a particular balance. Each number refers to a particular balance in the structure, right? Okay, so our cosmological picture here is that we have the minimal possible geometrically self-balanced so there's no magic being induced in the system. There's nothing that it's leaving out or requiring to have injected in to keep itself going, right? So it's just self-closed system. And we're going to call that a minimal universe or constructible universe. And the geometric story, as you go from the biggest sphere all the way down to the smallest wrapped complement volume, the hyperbolic figure eight knot on the inside, it changes a lot through the scales, but it's it, well, I should be more specific. It changes a lot through the smaller scales until we get out to the 10 to the negative 8. And at that point, it's a, a sphere, uh, I'm sorry, a torus, okay, a donut shape that's inside the big sphere that's the whole projection. The outer sphere has for its most primary experience on the large scales, all of its division happens because there's a torus, hurricane torus of space, <laughs> keeping its balance. That's the boundary that the rest of the sphere is resting on. That's why it can exist. Okay, So that toroidal decomposition, the fluid of, a, of this balance itself being decomposed under a toroidal bound, gives us exactly when we zoom in, we get a torus 
But in the division boundary of this torus goes like this. Right? If you think you're a piece of fluid, you're going to be doing moving around, doing follow wherever the fluid makes you go from where you started. But if you track all the fluid motions, nobody pack, nobody crosses these boundaries. That's the the region where nothing crosses. If you're close to it, you're going right along it, not going through it. Okay, so there's a division in the structure, not not with a gap. It doesn't introduce a gap. Notice, right? It's just a cutoff zone where all the medium itself divides around, doesn't cross through. Okay, so it's a little higher order concept in geometry because it's not an edge of a circle. It's an internal boundary that's there over time. It reveals itself over time. Once you're aware of it, you can paint it in and just watch every step of time and verify, yep, yeah, nothing's crossing, nothing's crossing. But you have to watch for a little bit to notice. Hey, look, you notice here that all the stuff's active over here, over here, but it never crosses this way, here. <laughs> It might be active there, but it's always in a certain direction, <laughs> right? Okay, so there's a, an internal boundary being maintained by these boundaries, by that hurricane wall. These are the ones you can see, right? If you were nearby, you would be looking and be blatantly aware that these boundaries are there, okay? There's a zero boundary there, but the zero boundary comes with an opposite kind of zero boundary. Cool? Okay, this is the internal first step decomposition of the outer sphere made that's ultimately internally resting on the minimal complement volume, the hyperbolic figure not. Could you say that last part on the left one more time? The whole part? Uh, just basically as it crosses over, the crossover part. Oh, so there's a big sphere resting on top of this right. decomposition, but these lines that I'm drawing, mm -hmm. this is a two-dimensional surface, right? It goes around here. And this is a different two-dimensional surface here. Both of those surfaces are called into existence at the same time by this balance. Okay, So this is a different kind of looking wall than this. But whenever you make this wall, this is necessarily in between it. It's the, the walls are, if you color all the little dots in the fluid and then track to where they went. Okay, Keep the same colors, get, you can see where each color moves. But you would notice that the paths that they all the dots followed never crossed this exact line, right? In fact, the closer they got to that line, it was very systematic and evenly smoothly doing this. As they get closer to this line, they're going more and more and more and more exactly along it. They can be going exactly along it as they approach it. As you get out here, you can be doing all kinds of different motions. But you get in there and it's moved exactly along it. So it's a limit of the degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a zero etched into reality, and that zero is a no-go zone. You don't get to cross it. Zeros are all double-sided, though. So you had in order to etch it in, you had to carve in. <laughs> right? Here's here's the other side of that zero. They come together. Follow? Is it? It's kind of a leap, but it almost reminds me of the jets that are coming out of a black hole. Yeah. It's not much of a leap. <laughs> it's the same sort of thing we're talking about. Now, you can have different angles for your cone-on-cone -cone structure, and we're going to call all of those hyperbolic decompositions, because what changes that? Just the size difference of the torus circles compared to each other. right? Those are all allowed, and they're all decomposing into tori on cone-on-cone. -on -cone. Okay, next step is to just zoom in closer at this two-dimensional surface. This one's a smooth bound. When you zoom in closer to it, it still looks pretty smooth. But this one, it resolves into a whole bunch of other, well, shoot, I need to actually draw them as tori that go around the center, like this. and so on, okay? So they're all linked into this one two-dimensional surface. That's what you see from the, from the distance. But when you get close to the surface, you notice, oh, it's actually a much more rich two-dimensional surface. It breaks into another structure that's composed of all these other tori, different scaled and a fixed whole number collection of different tori inside the torus, okay? Each torus to torus transition through the scales 
takes advantage of the exact same structure of cone on cone rotating, rotating everything about. So when you're partitioning the domain into smaller and smaller torus, 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 torus as you go in, it's always dividing a section that rotates like this, introducing a cone on cone, you know where the torus was, right? And, and cutting up the domain that way. So it's a fractal decomposition of tori that we're really talking about. But when we're saying that, we're also meaning the cone on cone boundary that you're introducing each time as you go in. Okay. Um, how does this help other than giving us a, a, a richer, specific set of details for a minimal cage, a minimal universe? Well, it helps because it turns out that the properties of this minimal universe, the geometric scalings for this hyperbolic construction and so on to, that fit to the hyperbolic figure eight knot, those scalings and all those properties of intersections from these different scalings that put into this one set give us all the properties of physics and chemistry. That's the really big deal. Now, we didn't get that story going forward. We got that story going backward, right? We looked at all the properties of physics and chemistry, the literal constants of nature, right? And the composite constants of nature. So how the constants are used together to do things, right? So the next level up, and I call those the chemistry constants. So all of these constants, which technically once we add the chemistry composite ones, we have eight times more data points than just the base 44 for physics. So that's a lot more data points. And we're almost done wrapping that up now. I might get to include most of that on this video. But this, the point is the minimal picture here, the geometry, the cosmological model we're holding in our head about what reality is. It's a decomposition structure made up of different actions that are balancing the minimal possible universe. The minimal thing that projects out to a sphere has to have an internal boundary, and those internal division boundaries have to have a certain shape. The minimal possible shape on the inside that they could be resting on, all the way even the inside. You can have many transforms of shape, but if you go to the bottom, bottom level, because it's a quantized set, a non-infinite radius, right? It's also going to be quantized in a number of steps. So at the bottom level, that step has to be balanced on a geometry of some sort. And if that's the minimal possible closed manifold, <laughs> then we're talking about the simplest possible way to form a projection on the outside, a universe that decomposes and maintains its own boundaries. And the logic structure of that decomposition, the way things break up into different pieces and fit together, defines all the rules in physics and chemistry, defines all the connective equations of physics, literally the equations, the algebra. It also defines the quaternion construction of reality. This four-dimensional decomposition is quaternion by definition. Right? Clifford algebra is captured in that picture. <laughs> the structure of the field that we're doing mathematical operations on in general, that, that discovery of that field in mathematics is the same thing we're discovering in physics. The geometry that's responsible for the actions of physics is the same field, the same structure of decomposition inside the minimal possible maintained stage, self-maintained, right? It's the same thing. So that decomposition logic is mathematics. <laughs> well, that was one of the big things that came up before when you're like, all right, based upon this construction right here, we can basically derive the fundamental theorem of calculus because that fundamental theory of calculus seems to also be used to dissect. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Calculus, its big insight is what? That we can get past not knowing. <laughs> we have a big problem with graphs. Graphs are the way we pictorially represent the relationship between two different things, two different dimensions, right? That's why they're different axes. And you can think of it as a general representation of a dimension, so we'll just call it X and call it Y, or you can label it time and space or whatever, right? But the problem is, when once you have a graph, you've got some sort of interesting graph that shows up and you know has interesting features to it, you might want to be able to ask specific questions of it, right? You can you look at it and you realize, oh, it turns out there's a minimal point here. First of all, I should be able to ask, what is that? There's at this point locally a, a maximal point. I should be able to ask that somehow. But how do you ask what that point is from the function that you had, right? How do you find out, say, 
from this minimal to this local maximum, if I drop a line down here and say how much area is underneath that part of the curve down to the, the axis, or you could change, I'm interested in two above the axis or two below, whatever. Be, there's all kinds of questions you could ask a graph. And a graph is literally your representation of the relationship between those two dimensions. So it's the way you're understanding how those two things fit together, right? So you want to be able to ask more questions. Fundamentally, if you want to know what the dimensions of reality are doing, how they're making reality, how the ingredients at the base of everything are doing the job they're doing, then you have to learn how to understand relationships. <laughs> this is a relationship of two. There's two dimensions, right? And the graph is telling you what the relationship is as those parameters between them change. Great. So there's properties built into the graph, like areas underneath the curve, right? Slopes at any certain point, all kinds of things. And he noticed that, or Newton and Leibniz and others, but Newton's the main figure usually in the story. He went home during the plague, something we might be able to be familiar with now, um, and you know, went through the eye of boredom, we might think today. <laughs> Instead of spending the entire time watching TV trying to pass the time by, he literally focused and focused and focused on one conversation, trying to understand how to understand relationships better. Okay, and to do that, he realized, well, I might not know how to just get an answer for the area underneath the curve, but I do know how to get something close. This is a huge insight, a huge insight, especially when it comes with the ability to then get closer and closer and closer, right? So he looks at this and says, well, I can stripe this thing up, right, into a whole bunch of shapes that I do know. I don't know how to get the area of that shape. <laughs> But I do know rectangles. But the problem with rectangles, of course, is that you're not going to be getting the exact area, but you are getting to get a close area, right? And how do you get closer? Make the rectangle smaller, right? So he came up with a conceptual way of seeing the world that allowed you to stripe things up, use the equation for striping things up to get an area, but then make the stripes smaller and smaller and smaller and find what the limiting approach to an area is. And now, voila, you have the ability to calculate the area between any two points. Magic, right? I mean, magic, insight. Imagine no one had thought of that before. So they were stuck at, oh, area under the curve? Well, your guess is good as mine. <laughs> He looked at it longer and realized, oh, I don't know how to, to get an area of that shape specifically, or if I change it from here to here, it's a different shape now. Right? I, I don't know how to do that specifically, but I do know how to do something else. The key feature I want you to focus on is that this striping things up and then getting smaller and smaller and smaller, what happens when you go to zero? Now you're dividing things by zero, right? Lots of times. <laughs> an infinite number of times. So he, he comes up with the concept of an infinitesimal, a thing that acts like a zero in all ways, except you can divide by it. Okay, he defined it as smaller than all other numbers, but bigger than zero. <laughs> it's confusing. It's not, it's not a very clear insight. It's not as clear as what this was doing, right? But it was, it's noticing that you have to have something at the bottom, right? And so I'm going to say, let's, let's don't treat it as a zero. Let's just say it's really, 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 really small like 10 to the negative age, 10 to the negative 18, or 10 to the negative 32. That's really small, but it's not zero. And then the stripes, therefore, won't go to zero. They're going to go to small, skinny stripes that have an exact value, right? It means you're quantizing the world and then counting up the number of things you did that way versus quantizing the world a different way. See, this is striping X in little slots like that, but you might be striping Y this way in a different scale. Now you get so many x per y, natural divisions. But this way of breaking things up into stripes <laughs> is a way of quantizing the subject, quantizing the graph, right? And here, we're quantizing a universe into existence. Before that, there were no universe properties. There was nothing. There was no speed of light. There was no communication. There was no people. There wasn't anything when it was just infinite chaos. The, smil the smallest, simplest possible structure that you can impose on chaos is this one, the hyperbolic figure eight knot, 
at being its minimal internal volume complement, the thing that it's resting on as it wraps around at the very inside, and, and hypersphere of maximal volume on the outside. It's all connected as one piece of parts moving around, and on different scales, it looks like bigger pieces moving slower, doing different things as you tell you get to the outside. But that's it. That's the minimal possible construction to have a balanced logic structure, to have a thing that's making itself, okay? That thing that's making itself, though, builds in all the inherent division rules. The boundaries that you can't cross invoke division rules, <laughs> the connections in everything. So the whole field in quantum field theory or in mathematics, the field in which we're doing operations, the field is the conversation. It's the, the way we twist things up defines the field you're with, you, know, you end up with. Here, we're trying to define the exact properties of all the minimal possible field. Okay? It's a quantized structure, so it's a minimal possible one. And it turns out that minimal one is really big from human points of view. It's really big, 10 to the 32 meters is the radius on the outside. Right? That's really, really big. And most of its interesting construction happens inside 10 to the negative 8. <laughs> what does that mean? That means above 10 to the negative 8, approaching the scale of 1, 10 to the 0, right? And then all the way up to 10 to the, ne to the positive 32, most of those scales, everything looks flat on most of those scales. So if you're looking into the world and you're looking at things, the concepts that you're referencing and making sense of and telling a story and projecting into the world are things that are table size <laughs> and chair size and maybe finger size. You're looking at the world at a very, very small range of scales and all of those scales are well within the range in which things look flat. How does this decomposition structure not be flat on the big scales? Because the whole thing's pulling itself apart just on different sizes and different rotations, right? It closes and inverts and closes and inverts over and over and over without ever having a gap except for the internal volume complement that it's distorting the whole thing to get from the get-go. Okay, so this is a great cosmology that's connecting this with understanding the mathematical operations in fields, right? The, the fields of math but also the actions or the dimensions or bases of physics, time, space, charge, mass, and temperature. Those are the five different ways that the parts of this shape break up. And after that, it's just different numbers of those pieces conspiring together to do something, but it's still the same kinds of thing. There's only five kinds of things in the geometry's decomposition. So there's five bases built in. And the minimal base, the smallest one, happens to have a rotation value that's equivalent to the Planck times number. And the next one has a rotation value equivalent to the Planck lengths number, and on and on and on. And the scale associated is the base 10 scale that each one has also. So this structure is coding in the bases numerically also. Why? Because it's a division structure. It's defining the division algebra, the logic of the connection built in, and it's self-closed, so it does the same thing over and over and over. That's why it's a reliable logic. <laughs> All right, so I really like the details that this is bringing together, but it also goes up to the next level of chemistry, right? All of this conversation is a conversation about the patterns of atoms. The things we've looked into the world made up of atoms have certain patterns, they have certain features, and every time we test for a certain feature, they show up. The concept of nature is just there. It's just always there, apparently, at least every time we look. <laughs> right? It, it, it's, it's really looking that way. Just Even just yesterday, just going through, looking through, finding different uh, pockets of computational uh, equivalence, computational reducibility. It's like, wait a second. Well, this is this. This is within this magnitude. And then still duck checking to see if it comes in within the error bars and everything and stuff like, okay, maybe this is a little off, but this error shrinks in this aspect. And like, that actually working was surprising. Yeah. Well, maybe it shouldn't be that actually surprising. When you think about it, each time we're getting a primary action and a terminal action, and each time it's roughly seven significant digits that it's given us to the picture. Maybe you don't have enough digits, and so you don't know the accuracy, maybe only a three but on the last one, it could be a seven. But it's a seven-digit piece 
That's a huge piece. If you can get something accurate to seven significant digits, <laughs> that's really good. That's better than you can see, right? It's better than your eye can distinguish on any characteristic there is. So if you can do that, you're doing really, really well, I guess. That's guess the point. So where do I want to go from here? What we've been doing is extending the same process to all the composite constants, all the ones that fit the constants together or the chemistry constants, right? So a lot more of them and we're almost done, but not quite. But I should, when I post this video, I should have it done and I'll be you know, putting up a map. And you think of this map, this is the collection of the base codes of reality, okay? All the way from the base f dimensional ingredients, the Planck time, the Planck length, the Planck charge, the Planck mass, and Planck temperature. It's using those five bases and building in all the relationships of those bases. This map is a chart of all the inherent built-in relationships we know of. And notice how they're all inherently easy to identify boundary-wise. They all have the Planck length in them or the Planck time or the Planck mass, or they might have the electron's mass, which if you look at one equation, you can see the relationship between the electron mass and the Planck mass. So everything's the built-in relationships of the Planck boundaries. And it's going to have certain balances it puts in certain places. Zero boundaries that are balances, right? They're being maintained. Cycles that close here and there using different parts in the structure. So the first thing you notice when you look at the map so far is that it's easily, very easily, dividing into natural continents. <laughs> so the structure I'm dividing uh, right away into the products and the sums of the hyperbolic vortex um, partition constants. Okay, They break up into two-dimensional and, and one-dimensional parts, and those parts maintain the construction that's ex on the exterior sphere. So they're quadrancing the sphere, right? They're, the sphere out here is being quadranced about two two-dimensional boundaries. <laughs> Quartering the sphere. Yeah. So uh, they're also summing to a balance. So J1 plus J2 plus J3 plus J4 is equal to zero. Maybe I can write these things one more time. Yeah, it's more clear, I guess, the more we do it. But we got a structure we're decomposing hyperbolically, right, under this hyperbolic vortex equation's balance. That's the hyperbolic vortex equation characterizes the algebraic connection of the balance of hyperbolic decomposition. It comes with the scaling parameter we need to set. Because remember, in hyperbolic space, things decompose with these boundaries being imposed. But if you make it a wider angle, you're just going to change where the ring goes but it still counts as a hyperbolic decomposition. It's a universal way of dividing hyperbolically. So if you want to pick a specific hyperbolic decomposition, the one that actually maps to the minimal decomposition structure, then you have to have a scale that sets it. It has to be a non-zero number setting the scale. So our hyperbolic vortex equation is just one over x plus x, where x is a variable, plus x cubed, should I go into full detail or short detail on this? Just short. Over 2 pi for our minimal closure here. And we set that equal to i to the i to the negative pi over 2. This is three rotations, like in the corner of the wall. You do a 90 degree rotation, a 90 degree rotation, and a 90 degree rotation, and close. Okay, so it's three orthogonal 90 degree rotations inside some mass boundary. And this is going to be the Planck mass. This is the scaling parameter of the construction. And the solutions to this equation, it's just a geometric connection, notice. It's, it's got a scale because we're in hyperbolic space, and hyperbolic spaces change in scale. Uh, to make that more clear, in Euclidean space, you can have similar triangles. Let's see, like that one and this one. Well, maybe not so, so good drawing, but you know what I mean. Similar triangles will have what? The same angles. Different sizes, same angles, and so the proportional relationships are the same between them, but the actual scales are different. Okay, in this is Euclidean, 
What do I mean by Euclidean? Flat. Flat. Okay, flat space. This is true in Euclidean space. There's no problem at all. But in hyperbolic space, you can't have similar triangles unless they're exactly the same size. So in hyperbolic space, there's no real similar triangles. They're always just copies of each other if they're similar. Right? It's just same triangles. <laughs> so that's really important. In hyperbolic space, you can't have similar balances. You need to specify the scale. It's really important. In Euclidean space, you don't need to specify the scale. These properties are, you zoom in by 10, zoom out by 10, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> okay. Now, now, is that because of uh, the curvature inherent in hyperbolic space? or? Yeah, because in hyperbolic space, things change as you go through the scales. Right in flat space, you have this big swath in this thing between let's above 10 to the negative 8 and below 10 to the 32. All those scales that's a lot of scales, <laughs> so within Euclidean, those are roughly flat. So yeah, within Euclidean space, if you increase the magnitude, the symmetry will be the same, but in hyperbolic space, if you increase the magnitude, the symmetry may be a bit more deranged. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So keep that in mind, hyperbolic space is different than Euclidean space. It has different geometric arrangements built in, okay? Um, let's keep going with this. What are the geometric relationships of this specific hyperbolic construction? What do I mean by specific? Well, it picked a scale. It's, it's doing the same exact structure of all this, and, then, and the 2 pi is assuming that this wraps around eventually into a circle. It doesn't go to infinity. It is a circle. Okay, and finite construction. So we've picked an exact scale, we've made it finite, and now we take the solutions of this are x equals j1, j2, j3, and j4. There's four solutions that you can put into this equation, and it is true. Yeah. There's, uh, there's one thing I think I we maybe need to clarify on. We didn't pick that magnitude for the Planck mass. You look, searched for what would this be if I was looking for essentially the Summerfield constant, which yeah, the fine structure constant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was pointed out to me that this construction, or something very similar to this construction, like maybe a squared version of it, um, was getting very, very close to one of its solutions being the square root of the fine structure constant, mm -hmm. right? And I've been looking for ways to geometrically decode and make sense of the fine structure constant for over a decade at that point. So I was really, really interested. Also, it got many digits. It didn't just get two digits. It got many digits, more than I'd seen. Okay, That's what really piqued my interest. So I just said, well, we have more digits. It missed some too, like four or so. right? So we have more digits we need to make. How much does it need to be off? How much do I have to change the same equation? Because this first equation got us closer than anything else. I just want to know. What's the simplest modification needed to make this so it gives us the right number we need for the square root of the fine structure constant, which turns out to be this number, okay, the first zero of this construction. So, And the number that got kicked out here when I asked the question this way was very recognizable, 2.17 times 10 to the negative 8. It's exactly the number I needed. That's the number I needed? I know what that number is. <laughs> It's the Planck mass boundary. And why is that exciting? Well, at this point, it's exciting because it jumps right to, I didn't, it took me a long time to make all these connections. But the Planck mass boundary is this, when we have, let's redraw it here. When we have this hyperbolic space, there's um, another two dimensional surface you can talk about here and here and here and here. I hope you can see where those were over here. <laughs> but there's these other boundaries put in play, okay? And this is a two-dimensional surface, and this is a two, these two together are a two-dimensional surface, and they're ruled. They're ruled. Really important. What does that mean? It's not just that this is a, a balance that invents boundaries where things can't cross. It's that it invents boundaries that are ruled, meaning on these surfaces, a logic of x and y... The, the mathematical x and y operations of plus and minus and multiply and divide and powers and logs, all that, all that rules apply exactly on that surface. They work there. What? 
It's a ruled surface, so all the operations work there. They all work here. They all work here independently or at the same time. Okay, really, really cool. Um, why was I bringing that up? I'm trying to remember. Coming out oh yes, the, thank you. Yes, yes. This this gap here is the thing that's specifying the scaling parameter, right? Because since all of these different things could be different size of tori with different size cone, the fatter cone, just skinnier cones, right? The the size of the cone here is going to depend on the space created between the surfaces, right? So that gap is the Planck mass. So we've just we've talked about the same exact structure several times, and we're setting the number known from measurements, not known from theory, right? This is not known um, geometrically. It's not known um, algebraically. It's not known you know, geometrically at all. <laughs> we don't have a picture for it. We just have a measurement concluding that it must be there. Why? Because it, along with the other Planck constants, are the limiting constructive pieces that compose all the constants of nature. Those are the things we measure as there. The, thing, the constants of nature, we make those measurements. And all the constants of nature are composed, or when you put them together and divide one by other to try to cancel out parts, you can do it, and when you do, you can't cancel down to the Planck constants. And this is the one for mass. <laughs> so the mass gap of hyperbolic space turns out to be the mass gap that connects or the limiting mass boundary that connects all of chemistry and physics Pretty beautiful well, well <laughs> a, a, any time if the lambda you need to describe a fundamental constant of nature pops out another fundamental constant of nature i mean that's just interesting mm -hmm. it really really is so we have these four shows now and these solutions to this algebraic or geometric balance these are the pieces the zeros of that balance, right? When we add them together, then what are we getting? We're just getting the sum. And the sum of all those zeros <laughs> is a zero, true zero. Sum of all these division zeros um, or solutions of this equation equal zero. The product Just multiply them together now equals a circle. Okay, this is that's, I mean, this is really important. We got a construction holding the world together, but its parameters itself are maintaining a balance, collectively maintaining a balance. That's a nice start. They're producing a circle. So in that balance, that makes an inversion. <laughs> and the thing that they're quadrancing up, the thing that they're dividing that rests on top of them is just their squares added together. This is what we call quadrants. And that's negative for pi, the sphere. This is, this is the simplest construction, right? This is a really interesting numbers. They're geometrically characterizing the hyperbolic decomposition of the simplest construction, right? The one that's hyperbolic, self-closed, and or you could say Mobius self-closed here, and whose mass gap happens to be the Planck mass. Okay. When we're looking at these, decomposition pieces this is how the whole system divides into these pieces okay that's the simplest way to see it is just these pieces but these pieces in partial if you just want to take part and say well what's the action in just this part and just this part and so on you can decompose it more and talk about how those parts fit so that when you want to do that you want to keep in mind well, maybe this will be bright enough that Zhu one is on the real line, and we're going to call it one-dimensional, or its its imaginary component is zero. J2 is also on the real line, it's one-dimensional. J3 is not on the real line or the imaginary line. It's It's got values in both, so it's out here. And J4 is like the mirrored reflection down here. It's the same x value, it's a negative number, and this one's got a positive y, or imaginary component, and this one's got a negative measure component, and the numbers are the same, magnitudes are the same. 
but the signs are different. All right, but what I want to keep in your mind is that these two are one-dimensional each, and these two are two-dimensional each as numbers, right? So they're doing, this is a two-dimensional action, and that's a two-dimensional action. This is a one-dimensional, it's a one-dimensional in the total construction. So let's pair them by the dimensions that they're at. And then we'll go look for all the constants in nature against these pairings to see how these, this is the story of how everything fits together. But then you want to look at smaller pieces instead of all four of these contributions at a time. Say, so zoom in now just on these two. What do we get? Well, there's going to be connections in this construction using just these two, and connections using just these two, and so on. So when you're searching for the solutions of what the constants of nature are, in the terminal action, the thing that you're searching against, you have some number for the terminal action, and you type in it equals this times x and solve for x, or this times x and solve for x, or put a negative sign there or a negative sign there, right? Because you have this, you have also the opposite. Same thing with all these, just the positive or negatives, and that's it. And we get this entire list, I'll put it up again, um, of, think of this as a, a map of the universe, the code of the universe. And I, I'm not saying how much of it's right or wrong, it's getting more right. That's the point. I and mean, you can clearly see the more and more pattern is popping up. But these, these codes are clearly pooling into continents. Right? We're getting whole well, 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 continents. Well, well, <laughs> as we go by and it becomes more clear and accurate, you just start to notice, especially on the tail end there, these actions. And then you look at the co the constants that they line up with. It's like, it really looks like it's starting to tell a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're going to keep working with that. I still have some we haven't done, but we're almost at the end of the first round going through all the chemistry ones for the first time. And then we'll polish and re-ask questions until we get a story that fits better and better and better together and gets easier and easier to tell. But so far, I think we're at a story that's phenomenally beautiful compared to where we were a decade ago, right, for humanity. We have a story now that starts, that we can tell forward. We didn't get to it forward, we got to it backward. But when we start forward now, this is where our story is. We have a universe of infinite noise there's nothing in it. There are no measures that you can make. There's no conversation you can have in it. There are no measurable features. There's no forms in it, right? And we go from that noise infinite region to moving your parts around in a harmony, in a balance, to make the simplest closed balance possible. How do you go from the noise to using all that to do a dance that closes on itself over and over? And to do that, you form, no matter what you're doing, you're going to form some projection that goes out to some size sphere, right? It won't be infinite. We're doing finite construction. In fact, we want the smallest ones. So all the ones that are going to be smallest, quote, around smallest, they're all going to project to a sphere. And then you just want to know what's the decomposition boundary on the inside of the sphere look like that's keeping it up, that's responsible for it and all of its internal properties. But that idea in your head, that awareness that there is a projection much, much larger than us, and the pieces of that projection are moving against each other, forming the division boundaries that form the things around me, and we're taking advantage of those properties on purpose, this gives us a whole new way to take advantage of those properties on purpose. A whole new way, right? We can see the connections in the boundaries, and we can see why they're that way. We can see how nature changes them over time, and we can take advantage of faster ways to do the same thing, right? Or just less inhibited ways. When a plant's growing, if it doesn't have enough water, it's going to wait. There's going to be some parts of it that just chemically need some water to do the next transfer. <laughs> so you can make sure things have all the exact ingredients they need along the way for all the transforms to naturally progress. Anyway, there's lots of things we can do, but if you're jumping on board and doing this with us, and you want to look into the code and maybe find clearer answers as we're, as we're zipping things together, this is the partition structure of our connection. So when you're looking, look to see between this two-dimensional, this collection of one-dimensional actions or this collection of two-dimensional, right? If you want to also look at individually, you can look there too. This is the, the best story you could tell at this point because we've already told the story this way. So if things are breaking into smaller chunks from there, this is the, the next step for a way to chunk it down. And when you do, you can get the connections of all the concepts in nature. You just need to go that one step down. <laughs> All right.
that's kind of where we're at, but we have some other insights with uh, programming end goals and so on, right? You want to take over for that? Okay. Cool.